Uh, first of all, I want to just say to Pastor Jamie and the leadership team here that it's been great to be here. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, I want to thank you for the privilege. Uh, God willing, I'll be back sometime in 2016, and, um, you know, until they get tired of me, I'll keep coming back. It's, it's easy to get me here, as you know, because my parents live just up the road, and, and I love this area, and it's a beautiful church. I love preaching here, even though it's the only place I've ever fallen off the stage. <laughs> Who was here when that happened? Oh, man. But I popped right back up, didn't I? It was like, boom, right back up. It was like a trampoline. Um, so thank you. It has been great to be here. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And what we're going to do is we're going to start tonight with a mega giveaway. And uh, I'm going to give away five things because I wasn't, I wasn't faithful with giving them away as we went through. So five things. I got five questions here. And uh, we'll, we'll just see how we go. Then I'm going to make uh, the presentation. It'll be, I don't know, 30 or 45 minutes or something, maybe a little longer. Then we'll take a break. We'll wrap up that presentation. And then what we might do at the end is if, we're, if it's not too late, if it's, if it's not quite to 8.30, we might take 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever we want, for just live questions. You have a question about something that's related to the series. If nobody wants to stick around for that, then we can all just go home and, and uh, lament the Broncos' absolutely devastating loss today. <laughs> It happens, it happens. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, I've got a number of things here that are available. And so the first question is, I'm looking for the hand to go up. And I might have already asked this question, so if, if you've gotten it. Anyway, I was trying to come up with the ones I wanted. Okay, I need you to give me church history in 30 seconds. What were the four steps of church history, the four phases of church history? Okay, go ahead. Is, is it Bill? Okay. Yep. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Woo! Well done. Okay, now, Bill, you got a choice here. You've got these Bible study guides. I've got this lovely classic called The Desire of Ages, which is on the life of Christ. I've got two daily devotional books. It's like a boxed set. Uh, or I've got this absolutely astonishing book called A Thousand Shall Fall about the experience of... Um, Franz Hosel, who was a pacifist in Nazi Germany. You want the Bible studies? The What do you want? Study. study guides it is. Okay. I got two of those, by the way. Okay. Question number two. You can only win one. This is a one-time offer. Okay. Here we go. Um, hard one. This is a hard one. If you can give me the date, I'll be happy, but I want at least the year, preferably the date, of either... Constantine the Great's conversion to Christianity or, or Martin Luther's nailing of the 95 Theses to the door at Wittenberg, and I saw your hand first. Okay, very good. You don't remember the date, though, do you? You don't remember the date, do you? Very good. Okay, what do you want? Oh, Bible study guides. Okay. There we go. I already opened these, so they have my DNA on them. Okay, great to see you, brother. Okay, here we go. Th uh, third out of five. Okay, here's an easy one. Well, maybe it's not. Who was the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? I saw your hand first. Oh, okay, you got it. What do you want? It was the Roman Empire. What, do you want the book on Franz Hosel, the Desire of Ages large print, or the box set devotionals? Box set devotionals. Don't feel like these are the bottom of the prizes. This book is amazing. Okay, here we go. Number four. What was the Greek word rendered soul? What is it? Psyche, very good. Do not fear him that can destroy. Okay, what, what do you want? Desire of ages or thousand shall fall? Okay, thousand shall fall. Outstanding. Okay, in the final one, we read through Isaiah 53, and we had our eyes on two focal points. What were those two focal points? We had two points of emphasis all the way in the back. And the, what was the one? Brilliant. That's exactly right. Number one, the repeated references to caring or caring or bearing. And the re very good. Okay. I, I gave away almost every, I think I left you one thing over there, Jamie. That's for you. That's for you. All right. Tonight's a big one. They're all big, but tonight's really big, and uh, 
I, I, I'm absolutely over the moon about this, but I can, I, I imagine that this is going to be challenging for many of you. So just hear me out and tell me if you think I'm completely crazy, okay? I'm going to tell you what I think Revelation 13 is teaching. And um, tonight we're giving five good reasons to be nervous about the United States. Five good reasons to be nervous about the United States. So we're going to start with a quick prayer and we'll dive into the text of Scripture. Father in heaven, please be with us tonight on our last night, Father. It's, uh, it sounds sort of sad to say that, but it's been great to be here and to meet many new people and to reconnect with old friends, but Father, most importantly, to connect with you and your word. And tonight, as we turn our attention to Scripture, may you orient yourself to us. And Father, of course, you have already done that in the person of Jesus and by your spirit. Father, you have done everything possible to woo us, to invite us, to attract us to yourself. And Father, we know that we live in dark times. The attacks that recently happened in Paris is just one event in a long stream of of tragedies that have happened over the last several decades and centuries. And Father, uh, help us to be aware, to be sober-minded and cognizant of the times, the prophetically charged and significant times in which we live. And Father, we don't believe that our knowledge of the end times would save us. Jesus alone can save us. But we also want to be intelligent, we want to be aware, and we want to be biblically literate. And so we turn to Scripture now, and we ask that you will please orient us to the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, five good reasons. I'm giving it my first click here, and it's already arguing with me, Richard. So I turned it off, and I've restarted it. Okay, here we go. We'll see how it goes. Come now, let us reason together. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. And tonight, five good reasons to be nervous about the United States. Uh, I am proud to be an American, and I can say that because I now live in another country. And it's, no, I'm serious. It's interesting the things that you take for granted. Uh, that you, uh, has anybody here ever lived in another country? For an extended, okay. And, and you start to miss things about the U.S. that you didn't even, you wouldn't even thought of. At least this has been my experience. And uh, things like, oh, cheap gas prices, good customer service, restaurants that are actually open when people want to eat, things like that. Um, But the United States, for all of its positivity and for all of the the good things about it, and there are reasons to be proud to be an American, I am persuaded that the United States is increasingly going off the rails and that that will not be stopped. I don't think there's a political solution. I don't think there's a candidate that can stop what's happening because I think what's taking place is a larger issue here. Now, this is not a political presentation tonight, but it will certainly have political implications. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you from the text of scripture. And uh, will I see the events that uh, uh, I'm gonna describe tonight that I believe Bible prophecy describes in my lifetime? It's very possible. Some of those events I've already seen. Uh, the full extent of them, we just have to wait and see. And uh, so we're going to turn our attention. Reason number one then, let's start there. Bible prophecy foretells the rise of something that looks like the medieval church. We had a session just two, uh, two or three sessions ago in which we gave five good reasons, two sessions to go, five good reasons to be nervous about the church. And we talked about, as Bill reminded us, the formation by Christ, the deformation through the medieval period or the dark ages as it's sometimes called. Uh, then the restoration that uh, began at the beginning of the th- 14th century continues through and finds its, you know, the real epicenter of the Reformation with uh, Luther and his uh, protests, and then culminates in the, the move, the theological move through Protestantism in which people went back to the text of Scripture, hearkening to the battle cry of sola scriptura and started uncovering these gems that had been hidden for centuries. And here's the short version. During the period, the medieval period, the church came to bear no resemblance to the church that Jesus had established. The church, the apostolic church, looked nothing like the church of the 11th century. That's the simple way to say it. Or the 10th century, or the 9th century, or the 13th century. And reformers within the church, reformers like John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Martin Luther, John Huss, Philip Melanchthon, and others, they took a look at the church and said, well, they looked at the Bible, then they looked at the church. They looked at the Bible, then they looked at the church. They looked at the Bible, then they looked at the church. And they said, something's wrong here. Because this doesn't look like this, not even close. And so they started to raise protests, and they started to call for reforms within the church. Uh, Luther, most of the, the vast majority of the reformers, certainly not Luther or, or Wycliffe, believed that they were going to start, or Calvin, start some new 
denomination or some new church. They just believed that the church would rally around Scripture and that they would return to the calling and the beauty and the purpose that they had originally been uh, purposed to back when Jesus had said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. When the church resisted the moral reformation, however, they were left with no choice but to split from a church that said, you're excommunicated. And theologically speaking, when the church said, the church of the medieval period said, you're excommunicated, that was tantamount to saying, you're eternally lost. Well, that's, that's not exactly a friendly welcome. That's not a dialogue, let's sit down. That's not a come, let's reason together and sit down at the table and talk this over. That's a, hey, you're out and, you know, we'll threaten you with eternal separation from God. And finally, Luther and others said, okay, if you're going to play by that, then we're going to push back just as hard. And, and those exchanges between Luther and the church were not always perfectly gentlemanly. In fact, on, on, on the, in 1521 there, when Luther was brought before the deity at Worms and told to recant, he did say, I have been too severe in some of my writings, and I have said things in a spirit and in a way that Jesus himself would not have said. And for those things that I said in that unkind, un impolite way, I do take that back. But the substance of what I've said, I can't take that back. Uh, unless I am persuaded by Scripture, I cannot recant. And so it was an acrimonious split. That would be putting it mildly. It was a break from what was to what will be. And you have the launch of the Protestant Reformation, something that was born out of protest against the excesses, greed, and theological superstitions of the medieval church. Now, that's just a history lesson. I'm suggesting to you that Scripture says that that kind of thing is going to happen in the future, which seems impossible in our enlightened age, or does it? Does it really seem impossible that religious intolerance of that same kind and quality could be something that would emerge on the scene again? And I want to show you from the text of Scripture why I believe this to be the case. Okay, First of all, let's just make a few introductory statements. The book of Revelation is built on the Old Testament and on the book of Daniel in particular. And I'll give you several uh, instances, four instances of this tonight. Let's remind ourselves of Daniel chapter 7, okay? Of the major uh, prophecies, apocalyptic prophecies in the book of Daniel, you have the metal man, which we've talked about. Then that's Daniel chapter 2. Then in Daniel 7, you have these, these beasts, right? A lion with eagle's wings representing Babylon, a bear with three ribs that's asymmetrically propped up, which symbolized the imbalance between the Medes and the Persians that, that uh, were co-rulers of the world at the time, or of the, uh, the Mediterranean world. Uh, then we have the four-headed leopard with four wings of a fowl. That's Alexander's empire, moving swiftly, moving rapidly, but Alexander ultimately losing his life at a very young age, not more than 32, and in his place, his generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, coming up and this being symbolized astonishingly by the four heads, okay? Then this ferocious, terrible, crazy, wild, cruel, iron teeth beast comes up, possessing ten horns. Daniel doesn't know what to call it. He sees those ten horns. He thinks about them. He sees one little horn come up, and that little horn starts blaspheming God, making war against the saints, etc. That's a summary of the vision. Then the judgment is called to evaluate the claims that are made by this little horn power. So here's the vision. There's the picture, and here's the outline of what I've just described. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, medieval church, divine intervention, lion, bear, leopard, beast with ten horns, little horn, and then the judgment scene. These are the identifying marks of that little horn. This is, again, review, and you're going to see why we're reviewing this in just a second. It says that this little horn had eyes like the eyes of a man. It has a, a, a figure that guides it and leads it. Uh, it speaks pompous words, not against me, not against the state, but against God. Uh, made war against the saints, subdued three kings, persecuted the saints, changed times and laws, uh, rules for 1,260 prophetic days, exalts himself to the very place of Christ, took away the daily ministry of Christ, cast down the sanctuary in heaven, uh, cast truth to the ground and did all of this and prospered and grew. That's a summary of Daniel 7 and 8, the identifying marks of whoever this historical little horn power is. Come with me now to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, we're going to spend 90% of our time tonight in Revelation 13. So if you have a Bible or you want to turn in one of those pew Bibles, you will be hugely benefited to follow along. And I want you to see if you think I'm out to lunch here. Th you tell me if you think I'm crazy. Okay. I, I might be crazy for other reasons. My wife thinks I'm crazy because I can't remember where my wallet is or where my keys are, but I can remember almost everything I ever read. That's not the kind of crazy I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you think this interpretation is crazy. Revelation 13. 
Now, I'm going to give a brief summary here, very brief. Revelation 12, 13, and 14, as we've already mentioned, are the peak of the chiasm of Revelation. I want to say that again. They're the peak. They are the, they are the theological center of the book of Revelation. You have one set of stairs, chick, 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 that goes up on this side, and you have one set of stairs, chick, 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 goes up on this side, and the, the thematic chiastic center of the book of Revelation is Revelation 12, 13, and 14. Revelation 12 tells the story of the great conflict between Christ and Satan, between Michael and the archangel, and how uh, finally the woman flees away into the wilderness, and uh, Satan realizes that his time is short because Jesus has overcome the two weapons that Satan has, sin and death, and he goes out to make war with God's people. Okay, that's Revelation 12. That's big picture. Revelation 13, in fact, look at 12, 17. 12, 17, last verse of chapter 12. The dragon, that's Satan, Satan, was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So he goes out, he knows his time is short, sin has been overcome, death has been defeated, and so he's on a rampage. Chapter 13 then tells us the means by which he executes this war against God's last day people who keep the commandments of God and cling or have the faith of Jesus. And the means are two beasts. Revelation 13, we're going to go through it in depth. I'm just giving you an overview. There are two beasts. One beast comes up out of the sea, which you see here on the screen, the sea beast. The next beast comes up out of the land. Revelation 14 then tells us God's response to this satanic attack. So I'm just going to summarize. Revelation 12 is the big picture. Revelation 13 is the means by which the satanic attack will be levied against God's people in the last days. And Revelation 14 is how God will gain success over this attempted satanic snuffing out of the church. You got that? And that is the peak of the whole book of Revelation. Invite me back sometime and I'll do a series just on the book of Revelation. We'll start in chapter 1 and we'll go to chapter 22. And we'll just go right through it. It'll take us at least, at least two weeks. Yeah, does that sound fun? Okay, well, may, maybe that would be great. We'll just go right through and you'll see it. But for now, trust me, the chiastic thematic center of the book of Revelation is chapter 12, big picture, chapter 13, satanic attack through two beasts, chapter 14, God's response to the satanic attack. Okay, so now we're in chapter 13. It says, I, John, then I stood on the sand of the sea. John has been exiled to the island of Patmos. He's looking out over the Aegean Sea, which of course is a part of the larger Mediterranean body of water. And he sees a beast, this is very similar to Daniel 7, rising up out of the sea. It's about ready to get really similar to Daniel 7. Just as Daniel looked out over the sea and saw beasts come up out of the sea, watch this. Having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name, now verse 2, should jump off of the page. For those of you that have been attending night by night. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. Verse 3, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Verse 4, we'll stop here after we read this verse and take stock of what we've learned. So they worshiped the dragon. That's Satan himself. They worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Okay, so here's the summary. Clearly the dragon, Satan, is behind this attack. 12, 17 ends, Revelation 12 ends, verse 17, by saying that the dragon went to make war. 13 opens by letting us know how he makes war. And the means by which he makes war is he sets up, first of all, this beast that rises up out of the sea. Okay? Very Danielic. But it gets even more Danielic when we look at the way that this beast is described. It's described of, of consisting of the very same parts and pieces of the beast that we saw back in Daniel chapter 7, which was a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a beast with ten horns. Notice how this beast is, is described. It has the, pick it up in verse 2, it has the, the beast as I saw was like a leopard, there it is, its feet were like the feet of a bear, and its mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and verse 1 says it has ten horns. Okay, so, so there is no escaping the fact that John is firmly standing. He is resting his entire case for what's happening in the book of Revelation, not just on the larger body of the Old Testament, but especially on the book of Daniel. Okay? If we don't know what's happening back in Daniel 7, we're never going to figure out what's happening in Revelation 13. 
Okay, this is hugely Danielic. Now what we're going to do is we're going to read through the rest of these verses and then put up the identifying marks on the screen here. We're in verse 5. He was given a mouth, this beast, speaking great things and blasphemies. He was giving authority to continue for 42 months. 42 months. Hold on to that. He was, uh, verse 6, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, or his sanctuary. This is sounding very familiar. And those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints. That is a direct quotation from Daniel. He made war with the saints. The little horn did. To overcome them, authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity will go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Okay, let's see what we learned in these first 11 verses of Revelation 13. First of all, it's a composite of Daniel's seven beasts. Say amen if that makes sense. You see that, right? Lion, bear, leopard, ten, uh, hor ten horned beast. And that's exactly how this beast is described as an amalgamation of those very things. Number two, this beast receives a mortal wound, according to verse three, but is healed. Receives a deadly wound, but that deadly wound is healed. This will become very significant in a bit. This beast has worldwide popularity. It reigns or rules, this, this reign of tyranny is 42 months, which of course is three and a half years, right? You have 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 6, 42 months, which is the exact same period of, of time that we saw back in uh, Daniel chapter 7, 1,260 days, right? Because of 360 days in a Jewish year, 360 plus 360 plus 360 plus 180, that's three and a half years, 42 months. In fact, this is the single most significant period in all of Bible prophecy. It's mentioned five times between the books of Daniel and Revelation. Hugely significant, okay? We'll find out it's, it's even bigger than we might think, and you'll see that tonight. Um, blasphemes God, says that. Blasphemes the heavenly tabernacle, saw that. Makes war against the saints. Notice I put that in quotations because that is a direct quotation from Daniel 7. I'll just read it to you here. It'll take me seconds to turn back there so you can just hear this. I want you to hear the similarity, the exact similarity. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse... Uh, maybe it will take me... Oh, I'm in Daniel 2. No wonder it's not where it's supposed to be. Daniel 7 and... Verse 21, I was watching, the little horn made war against the saints. Okay, now let me read you from Revelation. Um, in verse, great things, verse 7, he made war against the saints. Same language, identical language. No question John is, is leaning strongly here on the Danielic prophecies. Okay, global authority finally is destroyed by divine intervention. All of that is straight out of the text. Do you agree? And no, I didn't add any of that, did I? Seven beasts, mortal wound, but healed, worldwide popularity, reigns for 400 and, uh, 400, or 42 months, 1,260 days, blasphemes God, blasphemes the heavenly tabernacle, makes war against the saints, global authority, destroyed by divine intervention. You satisfied that that's in the text? It's there. Okay, here we go. A quick reminder of how we ended up with the little horn or the medieval church. And this is one of the great twists, one of the great ironies in human history and certainly in Bible prophecy, that the church itself becomes the centerpiece of anti-Christian persecution and superstition. The church becomes the greatest enemy of the gospel. That's the simplest way to say it. Much of the history of the Christian church is that the church became the biggest enemy to the gospel. In fact, how many of us in this room have friends, well-meaning friends, intelligent friends, sincere friends who, who hate church or who would never go to church or who have a negative feeling about church? Okay, I want to tell you part of the reason for that is a residue of the history of what the church was for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, right? The church has a bad name. As I've mentioned before, the church is a four-letter word. Now, I said that one time, I think I mentioned in Australia, and people came up and were like, no, it's actually longer than that. No, it's C-H-U-R-C-H, six letters, David. I was like, no, you know, like a four-letter word? And they're like, ah, oh, forget it. But you know what I mean? In the minds of many, sadly, tragically, the church is a four-letter word. And we're living, we're living in the wake of the reality that the church has hugely failed the gospel. Hugely failed the gospel. And it's easy to point the finger, but you remember, as the old saying goes, when you point the finger, three fingers are pointing back at you, right? I, I, that's part of my problem, too. But historically speaking, during that deformation period, 
from the conversion of Constantine, which opened the door, leading up to the establishment of the Roman church that went right through, and the church just went down, down into superstition, down into greed, down into immorality, down into mingling with the state and currying, longing for political favor, right down to the bottom until finally, as we've already mentioned, the moral reformers said, blah, 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 no more. We got to change this. But that, that, that oh, spiritual obesity, all that weight that had been gained going down for centuries wasn't ju didn't just fall off any more than weight falls off of us that we've gained for years and years. No, 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 no. It's taken time for the church to climb back out through Lutheranism, Calvinism, Methodism. I mean, the giant men of God and beautiful uh, truths and, and churches that preached. No, nope, and then a little further, and then a little further, and then a little further, and that's where we're at right now. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay, that's the history, that's the short history of the Protestant Reformation. Well, check this out. Not only is it a, a, an exact recapitulation of the beast of Daniel 7, notice the order, it's critical. When Daniel sees the beasts, he sees, just as you would expect, he's looking back prophetically, and so he is describing as he looks back and sees them prophetically going forward from his time, or excuse me, as he's looking forward prophetically, Daniel's in the time of Babylon, and so he sees Babylon, followed by Medo-Persia, right? This is Daniel 2, this is Daniel 7, followed by Greece, right? This is Daniel 7, Daniel 2, Daniel 8, followed by Rome, followed by the division of Rome, followed by the emergence of the little horn, and then finally divine intervention. So he sees lion, bear, leopard, ten-horned beast. Okay, now watch what John sees. When John describes this beast, let me read it to you, verse 1. I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. Okay, so what characteristic does he begin with? He begins here, ten horns. Now watch this. Having te uh, seven heads and ten horns and on his heads ten crowns and on his heads a blasphemous name. The beast I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Well, this is obvious. John is writing at the end of the first century. John is writing during the time of Rome. Daniel's writing 600 years before. He's looking, I keep going the wrong side, sorry. <laughs> Daniel's writing 600 years before, and so he looks forward and sees lion, bear, leopard, ten-horned beast. John is living during the time, not of Babylon, but during the time of the ten-horned beast, Rome, right? And so he looks back, and he sees ten-horned beast, leopard, bear, lion. So far, so good. And the remark, th this is going to become so significant for us because this tells us that these prophecies have historical scope. They possess scope. They're not just random symbols that David decides that it says this and this preacher decides it says that and you decide. No. This is actually what's called the historicist view of biblical prophecy. It's a, that's the scholarly term, the historicist school of prophetic interpretation. And it says that apocalyptic prophecy moves from the time of the prophet through to the apocalypse. So if you're writing as Daniel in Daniel's day, when does the prophecy start? It starts in Daniel's day, and it moves forward from there. But if you're writing in John's day, where does the prophecy start? Starts in John's day and moves forward. But John is looking back. And as Daniel looked forward and saw lion, bear, leopard, ten-horned beast, John, living hundreds of years later, looks back and says, oh, ten-horned beast, leopard, bear, lion. So far, so good? Okay, let's continue on. The little horn of Daniel 7 and the sea beast of Revelation 13 are the same. The things that they do are exactly the same. Make war with the saints, prof, uh, 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 speak blasphemy, rule for the exact same period of time. There is just no escaping that whatever Daniel is describing in Daniel chapter 7, that little horn, that's the very same power entity that John is describing in Revelation chapter 13. It's the medieval church. It's the church who through the period of the dark ages was the main vehicle through which Satan worked to attack God's people. Remember, I'll remind you again. Chiastic structure, here's the top. Revelation 12, big picture. Revelation, big picture, and ends with uh, Satan making war against God's people. Revelation 13, how he makes war with God's people. Sea beast. We're going to talk about the land beast in just a second. And then finally, Revelation 14, God's response. And we'll end there tonight, okay? So, so John is letting us know the very same thing that Daniel was letting us know. This is a power that will wage war against God, against his people, against his truth, against his sanctuary, and against, I think I said, his church. So far, so good? 
Let me know if I'm going too fast. I, I don't feel like I am. Okay, so that's reason number one. Reason number one is that what we find in Revelation 13 is a recapitulation of what we saw in Daniel 7. Same beast, same power, same career. Reason number two. The two beasts of Revelation 13 work together to coerce the conscience and to force worship, according to the text. I'm going to show you this in the text right now. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the second beast that comes up. Okay. Let's talk about the second beast. It's called the earth beast. I'm picking it up in verse 11. Just going right through it. You might want to buckle your seatbelts. I don't know if these uh, pews have seatbelts, but if they do, buckle them because you're in for a big one tonight. Revelation 13, verse 11. John says, Then I saw another beast. Okay? Another nation. Another power. Another kingdom. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Okay, now this is different than the Danielic vision. Daniel saw his beast coming up out of the sea, but this beast comes up out of the earth. Now watch this. Verse 11 is a fascinating verse. It's the only verse like it in the entire canon of Scripture. The only verse in all, from Genesis to Revelation, it's the only verse like it. It's the only verse that contains these two words together in the same verse, in the same passage, and in this proximity. It says he has two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. The word lamb occurs almost 30 times in the New Testament, and every single time it's a reference to guess who? It's Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is the only time that the word lamb occurs in the New Testament and is not a direct reference to Jesus. Okay? So this is interesting. It says this earth beast comes up. It has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a dragon. Okay, so who's the dragon? That's Satan. So you have in just immediate juxtaposition, setting right side by side, this, the, the massive internal tension of Revelation 13, 11 is, or 13, 11 is giant. Because it talks about the Lamb, which is always Jesus, and Jesus' principles and mercy and goodness and kindness and freedom and liberty. And just immediately next to that is, but it talks like a dragon. Looks like a lamb, talks like a dragon. Hey, that sounds like a wolf in... Right? Very similar imagery here. Okay, now let's continue to talk about who this beast is. Verse 12, he exercises all the power of the first beast, the sea beast. This guy behaves like the second beast, or excuse me, the first beast. Okay, what does he do? In his presence, and he causes, now I don't know if you're in the habit of underlining in your Bible, but there's going to be four things I'm going to tell you, I'm going to urge you to underline in chapter 13. And the first one is causes in verse 12. He causes he forces, he compels, he coerces, he insists, he causes. He causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. I want to ask you a question. Is worship something that can be legitimately caused, forced, compelled, or coerced? Absolutely not, because worship is simply an extension of love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second is like it, to love your neighbors yourself. Worship cannot be coerced. Okay, the, the, the uh, uh, veneer of worship or a picture of worship or a counterfeit of worship could be coerced on pain of death or, or some other threat, but, but worship cannot be actually forced. You can't change the heart. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still, right? But notice what the second beast does. The second beast causes the earth to worship the first beast. Now, just very briefly here, remember, the first beast is propped up by none other than Satan himself, and now what we're learning is that this second beast is propping up the first beast as well. So there's this whole, in fact, very briefly, one of the major motifs of the book of Revelation, we can talk about this if you invite me back. One of the major motifs of the book of Revelation is what scholars have identified as what's called the counterfeit motif. The counterfeit motif. And I'll just give you a few quick instances. One of the counterfeits is Jesus has a city, it's the New Jerusalem. But there's also Satan's city in the book of Revelation, Babylon. So the true, the counterfeit. Jesus has a warning message, the three angels' messages. There's a counterfeit warning message. There is, uh, here, here's a great example. Um, there is the true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there is a false trinity in, in the book of Revelation. You have the dragon, which is like the father. You have the beast, which we're going to see in just a second, tries to act like Jesus. And you have the false prophet who tries to act like the Holy Spirit by calling fire down like the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost. So you have this like counterfeit thing going on. So like God does something, Satan does something. God does something, Satan does something. God does something, Satan does something. And what John is doing, he's setting up, he's writing in, with literary profundity, and he's saying, look, look guys, this is the true, this is the genuine, this is the counterfeit. 
Okay, this is the counterfeit. And what he's saying here is here's these three powers that are working together to bring a universal message of worship. Three powers, think it through. Three powers working together to bring a, a, a universal message of worship. Well, that sounds almost like the gospel. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are working together to bring a universal message because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that all of us would come to love him, to receive his love for us, and to worship him in spirit and in truth. Do you agree with that? So this is a counterfeit message. But where God woos, God invites, God attracts, this, conspira- this, this counterfeit Trinitarian power doesn't woo or invite by the beauty of its message and by the beauty of its character and nature. No, it forces It compels, and we're going to find that that compulsion is on pain of death. Watch this. Verse 13. He performs great signs. Okay. He even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs that he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Here's the second thing I'm going to invite you to underline, second of four. Telling those who dwell on the the earth to make an image to the beast who is wounded by the sword and live. Telling them, hey, make an image telling them. Verse 15, he was granted power to give breath. Breath in biblical thinking, in Hebrew thinking, when Adam breathed, uh, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he became a living soul. This second beast breathes life into this first beast that looked like it had died. It had received a deadly wound, but now it's received, as it were, mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Breathes life. That is very, that is also counterfeit. There's the true breath of life, and then there's this like satanic resurrection that's taking place. Okay? Hang on there. If you're thinking, uh, what does this all mean? We're doing, di- we're doing diligence. I want you to see this. Gave breath. Um, I'm in verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and here's number three, cause. As many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So there's the coercion on pain of death. Clearly, this is not an attractional model. This is not, hey, come on over here. God is good. He's beautiful. He laid down his life. He values, his, he values your existence more than his own. Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. That is not what's going on here. This is you or else. Verse 16, he causes, fourth and final instance. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark. This is the famed mark of the beast on their right hand or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell. So there's also economic incentives. Can't buy or sell. The whole earth can't buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of of a man and his number is 666. Okay, let's go through the identifying marks. Okay, we'll do exactly the same thing on the screen here. Exercises the authority of the first beast. Behaves like the first beast, number one. Number two, Causes the earth to worship the first beast. Props up the first beast. Okay? Number three. Causes great signs and wonders, including, and this is a fascinating one, fire to come down, from, uh, fire to come down on the earth in the sight of men. Now, I think there are, there's certainly one biblical application here, but I'm going to suggest one a little bit later that, that you might hate or you might love. But I'm going to say it anyway. Um... The first one here is clearly, this is a reference to what took place on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit caused tongues of fire to come down upon the church. Remember that? And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. So this is like, hey, this is like a religious, hey, look, there's a religious power associated with this. It's like a counterfeit Holy Spirit. Deceives earth by by these signs, makes an image of the first beast. By the way, this is straight out of Daniel. And I'll just quickly cue you into that. Many of you as children, if you were growing up in the church, and even if you weren't, you might have heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in which there was an image that was set up on the plain of Dura. And Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody is going to bow down and worship that image. And if you don't bow down and worship that image, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace. That is the backdrop for Revelation 13. Here, a power that's combining, we're going to see, church and state. We know it's church and state because there's worship. And we know it's state because it's it's legislative, causing the earth. So this is the combination of church and state setting up an image, just like Nebuchadnezzar back in Babylon, and telling everybody, worship the image, worship the image, worship the image. And if you don't worship the image, uh, then you'll be killed. And here's an interesting thing. In the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all you had to do to worship was just just to bow down. Your heart, you could have been thinking, this is absolutely ridiculous. I don't care about this idol, and I think this is stupid, but I'll bow down anyway. 
You could have bowed down out of convenience. You weren't bowing down out of attraction. You weren't bowing down out of love. You were not bowing down out of loyalty. You were bowing down out of fear. And that's not worship. That's a farce. You got me? True worship is when the heart goes out to the creator. It goes out to the redeemer. It goes out to the one who made us and saved us and, and, and wants to turn us into the best versions of ourselves. That's true worship. But anybody can bow down. Anybody can bend their knees, right? As long as you're biologically capable of doing it, you just go along with it. And that's a lot of what took place on the plane to Dura. They're like, well, I don't want to get whacked. So, okay, oh, great image. Oh, great image. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Okay? That's what's going to happen here in this compulsory worship. It's not going to be like the longing of the heart for the vast majority of people. Ba the vast majority of people are going to do it out of fear and convenience and out of economic uh, desire to get along economically. So far, so good. Okay, makes an image. Here we go. Gives breath to the sea beast. We've already mentioned that. Threatens death to noncompliance. Enforces a mark of loyalty. There's been a lot of conjecture about what the mark of the beast is. Clearly, the mark of the beast in the context of Revelation 13 is some mark that distinguishes those that are loyal to this counterfeit religious worship system. I have my own strong convictions about what the mark of the beast is. We're not going to be able to get into that tonight, but like I say, maybe I'll come back and then we can talk all about that. Employs economic threats and means. Okay, so reason number one, we're, I'm suggesting we're going to see a resurgence of the medieval church. Reason number two, this first beast uh, and second beast are built on the prophecies of Daniel, and it looks, it looks scary, okay? Not scary like for believers, but for the world. It, it, I mean, John is clearly trying to paint a, a dismal, miserable picture here, and it is. Okay, reason number three. This is key. The timing of the arrival of the sea beast is critical. The timing of the arrival of the sea beast is critical. And this is probably a great time to take a break. Okay? So we'll do a 13-minute break, which means I'm going to start speaking at 7.30 on the button. Okay? That's plenty long. We'll come back in for number three.